Um, just a um, quick mention that um, this is material that I'm presenting, um, publishing in a volume that Moira Hazlett uh, is, uh, is editing, um, Irish Literature and Transition, 1700 to 18, uh, 1780. Um, and so... Um, my thanks to her um, for her encouragement um, in uh, doing this work. Um, I should also say thanks to the historians who have read, including David, uh, whose work, and he'll, he'll recognize his work um, in, in the course of this, um, this, as it informs this paper. Um, and I should uh, just say there's no power, but I don't have any long uh, quotations, I'm not... Um, going to use a PowerPoint and I hope I'll be able to make the text clear. So the title, uh, to repeat it, is An Example to the Whole World, Patriotism and Imperialism mm -hmm. in Early Irish Fiction. <clears throat> Imperial analogues appear frequently in the political and fictional imagination of Anglophone writers in Ireland over the course of the 18th century. Such writers typically of the Protestant ascendancy, increasingly came to see their interests in being, as being in opposition to England's, developing thereby a sense of patriotism with regard to their separate identity. In his classic work of Irish patriotism, The Case of Ireland Stated, published 1698 and thereafter reprinted often, William Molyneux, invade against the view that, quote, some raise against us that Ireland is to be looked upon only as a colony from England. For Molyneux, the idea that Ireland could be regarded as a colony was to be firmly resisted in favour of an assertion of its legislative independence based on the due recognition of Ireland's position as a sister kingdom to England. Nevertheless, his repudiation of the idea only served to raise the spectre of its corollary, that the colonial model was indeed the standard. Colonial metaphors, often drawing on historical and classical parallels in the imagination of the enlightened Protestant order, came readily to mind during an era which witnessed, um, which succeeded the plantation of Ireland, and from the early 17th century witnessed the establishment and subsequent loss of the American colonies in the West, followed by the foundation of a burgeoning empire in the East. Most famously, this was revealed in Jonathan Swift's satirical fantasy of other worlds, Gulliver's Travels, published 1726, um, first published under the title, Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World. This was a work that was clearly indebted to and parodic of the immensely popular genre of European travel writing, a mode that, along with other imperial practices, was productive of what Mary Louise Pratt has described as, quote, a Euro-centred form of global or planetary consciousness. Swift's reputation as the preeminent Anglo-Irish writer of the period and the canonical status of his satirical and fictional masterpiece have led his work to be often read somewhat in isolation as a work of monumental and idiosyncratic genius. This paper will attempt to um, address this lacuna um, and open up the field to further investigation by reading Gulliver's Travels in relation to other works of fiction with significant imperial analogues, in particular the anonymously published Virtue Rewarded, or The Irish Princess, 1693, and Charles Johnston's The History of Arsaces, Prince of Betlis, 1774. In doing so, it will suggest a complex imbrication of colonial and imperial concerns with other better recognised issues of civility, ethnicity and identity pertaining to Ireland that are embodied in these fictions with particular regard to the growing sense of patriotism emerging amongst the Protestant ascendancy at this time. A common feature in all these works of fiction is of undoubtedly their engagement with colonial societies and paradigms, 
imagined variously in time, location and proximity to their contemporary moment. And integral to these variously imagined engagements is the concern broadly indebted to early modern and enlightenment modes of thinking with the distinction between civility and barbarity marked out at this time as visibly inherent in the difference between Europe and its others. The latter denoted especially by the savage peoples of the New World and of Africa, as reported to educated readers through the literature of travel. A complicating factor in this broad distinction of Enlightenment thinking, though, um, is the anomalous place granted to Ireland within it, akin in many ways to the savagery associated with non-European others. In their own ways, each of the major primary texts under discussion in this chapter can be seen to respond to, complicate and challenge these unpalatable charges which were still prevalent amongst contemporaries, especially in English. While the Williamite Wars of 1690-91 to mark a definitive moment in modern Irish history and obviously secured the political framework for English Protestant rule over Ireland in the 18th century, it is worth recalling that this famous victory, too often remembered in anachron uh, sorry, anachronistically nationalistic and narrowly sectarian terms today, bore larger European and global dimensions during an era in which Britain was rapidly expanding both, both westwards and eastwards. These wider European and global aspects of the conflict are very much in evidence in virtue re rewarded, set in Clonmel during the military campaign and published with remarkable rapidity in the wake of the Williamite Wars. The primary plot concerns the romance between a European prince of a small principality leading the Williamite forces into Clonmel and a young lady of the town named Marin Marinda. She proves, in her own countrified way, witty, accomplished and cultured, but she is of no great consequence in lineage or wealth. Though the prince is struck by her beauty and pursues her with ardour, he initially has no intentions of marrying her. Her, her refu principled refusal of his suit brings him around to a full and proper appreciation of her virtue as much as of her beauty, predictably resolving the romance and elevating her to the position of a princess. Interpolated with the primary story are two other narratives. The first, of a holy well, based on supposedly ancient Irish folklore, though exposed by its modern editors to be fake lore, and the other, a tale of the Spanish conquest of Peru, which draws on Paul Rico's translation of Garcilaso de la, Ve de la Vega's The Royal Com Commentary Commentaries of Peru, uh, published 1688. These interpolations cohere with the principal narrative of Merinda's virtue, extending its implications both historically and geographically, and hybridizing its generic composition considerably. Clearly, the primary narrative of Virtue Rewarded, set in Clonmel, with its dis di descriptions of interactions between the gentry and the Willemite forces, is drawn from close knowledge of provincial Ireland in the period. It is evident that the small town but cultured world that welcomes the foreign prince comprises the English-speaking Protestant order of Ireland. Though the action of the novel is not centrally concerned with battle, warfare and conquest offer significant metaphors for the development of the romance in keeping with the military ethos of the major male characters. <clears throat> On the edges of the narrative, we hear of attacks by rapparees or Irish irregulars who live up to the standard view of Irish uncouthness molesting women and behaving with barbarous insolence to the civilised order of the country. The prince's intervention in one such instance, when he writes to the rescue of a gentlewoman under attack, 
her status attested by the maid accompanying her, quickly reveals the disparity between the chivalrous code of honour observed by the prince and the rude behaviour of the Irish countryman intent on, be harming, on harming the woman. A twist in the tale is soon apparent when it emerges that the young woman in question is Mirinda. However, she shows little gratitude to the prince, as at this point in the narrative she is convinced that the prince, despite his professions of love, is in fact secretly married, thus rendering his intentions somewhat less than honourable. Her belief in the prince's perfidious, perfidiousness, moreover, is the result of a somewhat devious plot engineered by the prince's confidant, Celadon, and approved by the prince to ascertain whether the prince might not enjoy her favours without actually marrying her. Hence, his rescue is met with cold rebuff. Mirinda's resolve, however, not to entertain the prince's suit under such circumstances only proves her virtue beyond a doubt, now guiding the fully enamoured prince towards the only course by which he might satisfy both honour and passion, to disabuse her of Celadon's falsehood and to seek her hand in marriage sincerely. The patriotism of the Irish settler community keen to assert its good faith, symbolised here by the virtuousness of its women, is in in interestingly paralleled in the inset, supposedly folkloric, tale of Cluenicia, daughter of King of Munster. Cluenicia, under suspicion of dishonour from the swelling of her belly, vindicates herself by drinking from a holy well associated with the power of disclosing virtue. Her virtue is rewarded by the restoration of her health and her return to royal as well as popular favour. Mirinda's assumption into royalty when she marries the prince by the end of the novel only points to the parallel suggested by the interpolated tale of her alter ego from an earlier era, the real Irish princess Cluenicia, whose virtue is also rewarded and whose higher aristocratic birth foreshadows the aspirations and in the wake of the Williamite Wars confidence of the Protestant property elite who were already busily replacing the native aristocracy and legitimizing their rule in Ireland. The use of settler fake law, silently displacing the folklore of Ireland, bespeaks in literary form the supplanting tendencies of the settler group, even as it asserts the civility and virtue of a bygone era in Ireland, which the debased native population of Ireland had failed to properly represent. Perhaps a more complex and unsettling representation of colonial occupancy and legitimacy may be seen in another significant inset narrative. Uh, of this novel, the story of Faniaca, set in Peruvian South America under progressive colonization by the Spanish. Here the Spanish encounter the Incas and another indigenous group, the Antisuyans, a cannibalistic <coughs> though nobly savage tribe who had resisted incursions by the Incas. Drawing in detail on Garcileso's royal com commentaries, which depict <coughs> the Spanish con conquest, despite its pretensions of civility, as a treacherous and avaricious enterprise waged against the naivete of the South American peoples, this story involves yet another romance, this between Faniaca, the daughter of an anti suyan priest, and a Spanish conquistador, Al Al Sto Astolfo. The stark contrast of civilizational values involved in this encounter between the superior military organization and firepower of the Spaniards, aided by their colonial subjects, the Incas, and the barbarity of the cannibalistic anti suyans bears subtle, subtle parallels with the deeper undercurrent of the novel, contrasting the guile and sophistication of the Williamite order, represented by the prince and Celadon, with the crude resistance displayed by the native Irish. The covetousness 
of the Spanish for gold matches the prince's passion for Merinda, while the honourable nature of the Antisuyans finds its correlative in the bravery of the Irish resistance. <coughs> These unsettling depictions of imperial honour and morality trouble any simplistic opposition between barbarity and civility, rendering the text both complex and conciliatory. Details of the cannibalistic habits of the Antisuyans, drawn from the royal commentaries, which was also an influence, by the way, on Swift's modest proposal, would remind readers familiar with stereotypes of the wild Irish of their legendary cannibalism, playing into this long-standing tradition, though also complicating it. Comparably, the novel's depiction of the native Irish resistance to the Williamite forces mingles ideas of savagery with those of honour, typified here by the novel's partially admiring portrait of the Irish hero Patrick Sarsfield's raid at Ballyniti. <coughs> Though we learn that Sarsfield, quote, surprised the convoy and cutting them to pieces, burnt them, their carriages and provision, provisions to ashes, his, quote, unusual bravery in penetrating the countryside under English control to mount his attack is equally commended by the author. A similarly provisional view with regard to ideas of imperial superiority may be found in the primary source text for the South American elements of the narrative of virtue rewarded. Garcileso's evidently mixed feelings regarding the Spanish conquest of the American Indians derives no doubt from his own mixed racial identity, signalled by his nom de plume in Rico's translation of, quote, the Inca Garcilaso de la Vegas, as the son of an Inca princess, Isabel Suarez Chimpo Oclu, and a Spaniard, who later arranged for Isabel's marriage in order to facilitate his own marriage to a Spanish woman. The reworking of the uh, Spanish historical materials by Rico and the author of Virtue Rewarded to satisfy divergent national and monarchical preferences suggests the malleability of the narrative to suit imperial intentions that are unsurprisingly common to the major Catholic and Protestant ruling interests of Europe. European imperialism, in this view, was but a necessary mode of advancement taken in competition with other European uh, powers playing for the same stakes. Returning to the narrative of virtue rewarded in this light, we may note the apparently anomalous recruitment of the Catholic Spaniard Astolfo to the Protestant forces of William of Orange, which is the reason for his presence in Ireland, along with the Williamite troops. But as historian Ian McBride has noted, uh, William himself was a pragmatist and displayed religious tolerance. By falling foul of Spanish law for the honourable crime of killing his sister's betrayer, Astolfo is forced into fleeing his own country. Taking advantage of the Dutch recruitment of troops on the continent, as he later explains, quote, for some design they had not yet divulged, he enters into a pragmatic and yet honourable allegiance to William, raising the possibility by his example in the context of a religiously divided settlement that religious differences might be overcome after all. In the denouement of the novel, Fanyaka's tracking down and reclamation of Astolfo in Clonmel frees Merinda's rich cousin Diana from his suit, and she is evidently uncomfortable with his Catholicism as much as his Spanishness, though her father favours the match, allowing her to marry the English Protestant officer Celadon. The ending of this multi-layered novel with its several intercommunal, interreligious and interethnic romances brought to the successful conclusion of matrimony suggests the ambition of its fictional world to elide complex religious and cultural differences and envisage the successful integration of hitherto disparate elements within the promised harmony of the Williamite settlement. The historical 
experience of the early decades of the 18th century seemed, however, to offer a far more somber view of Ireland's status under English rule than that suggested by the happy ending of virtue rewarded. What was evident to Jonathan Swift, certainly by the first decade of the, of the century, was that, far from harmonizing relations and ushering in, a, in an age of peace and prosperity, English rule had considerably damaged Ireland's economic prospects and resulted in an impoverished populace and an alienated ruling order. An early representation of Ireland's abandonment in Swift's extensive pamphleting oeuvre appears in The Story of the Injured Lady, 1707, a tale that offers in its allegory a neat antithesis of the moral of virtue rewarded. Here, the injured lady who represents Ireland sacrifices her virtue credulously, resulting in her lover, quoting, affecting on all occasions to shew his authority and to act like a conqueror. The lover's shameful treatment of his lady and his exploitation of her estate offer obvious parallels with colonial practices, while the advice offered by the lady's friend in The Answer to the Injured Lady Swift penned, asserts in strict allegorical form the key elements of a coherent patriotic and colonial stance, namely constitutional equality, freedom of trade, liberty to develop resources, and the rejection of absenteeism. While these cardinal points, as Joseph McMinn has shown, would characterize Swift's political thought throughout his career as an Irish patriot, it is the lady's moral imperfection. She is undone, quote, half by force and half by consent. That offers us the nearest clue to the perpetual ambivalence regarding Ireland, which would inform Swift's work. Swift's most ambitious and unsettling exploration of such views appears, however, in Gulliver's Travels. Framed as a travel narrative, its four books and the strange lands they describe provide a parodic and many-angled view of social and political relations, both locally and globally. Though Gulliver is admittedly an Englishman, and there is little explicit mention of Ireland in the work, it is evident that Swift's Irishness forms, informs many of the text's most, most trenchant observations on colonialism, most famously in Gulliver's rigging denunciation towards the end of Book 4. And I quote this famous passage. Natives are driven out or destroyed, their princes tortured or dis to discover their gold, a free license given to all acts of humanity and lust, the earth reeking with the blood of its inhabitants, and this execrable crew of butchers employed in so pious an expedition is a modern colony sent to convert an idolatrous and barbarous people. While well, this description of colonialism as a form of plunder, particularly of gold, is obviously indebted to the black legend of the Spanish conquest of the Indies, uh, more obviously related to the Spanish conquest of the Indies than to Anglophone perceptions of British imperialism, other elements of the description, in particular its emphasis on the dispossession of natives and the conversion of an idolatrous and barbarous people, could apply quite obviously to the Irish example. Along such lines, a further distinction could be drawn between the English and Scottish occupiers of Ireland, implying a finer degree of irony with regard to the antagonism of dissenting Protestants, mainly the Scots Presbyterian settlers, to Irish Catholics, both being deluded in Swift's orthodox Anglican view and savage to boot. Yet, Swift's indignation at England's treatment of Ireland as a colony was largely limited to his perception of metropolitan perfidiousness with regard to the English settlers with whom he identified, while the deeply damaging effects of the penal laws on native Irish Catholics were overlooked, and Irish favour shown to the Presbyterian settlers on the basis of their shared Protestantism uh, seemed misguided. 
At one level then, Gulliver's unsubtle attempt in the paragraph that follows to dissociate Britain from such criticisms and to commend the British court as an example to the whole world for their wisdom, care and justice in planting colonies is a masterstroke of irony involving Swift's Irish patriotism to the full even as it is now played out in a vastly expanded global critique of empire. At another, though, it reflects an uneasy light on Swift's own highly ambivalent position as an English settler in Ireland, intent on the preservation of the Protestant, specifically Anglican power, within its legislative order. Comparing the specific and limited focus of Swift's pamphleteering with the wide-angled and multidimensional view of Gulliver's travels, one is struck by the extent to which the latter absorbs and transcends his earlier political thinking, assimilating such views within an expanding global order of imperial um, European imperial domination led by Britain, even as it insisted on the probity and integrity of its own supposedly civilizing mission. While the story of the injured lady offers a neat allegorical representation of uh, colonial relations between England and Ireland, with Scotland synecdocally represent, representing her Presbyterian um, settlers in Ireland, appearing as Ireland's violently ill-tempered, though higher-favoured rival for English affections, Gulliver's reference in the passage cited above to the gold lust of colonial endeavour recalls the English stereotypical view of Spanish imperialism, a trope evident too in Virtue Rewarded, and his commendation in defence of uh, British colonialism of, quote, the most vigilant and virtuous governors who have no other views than the happiness of the people over whom they preside, extends his critique through its heavily laden irony to virtually all forms of European colonialism since the discovery of the new world. Such universalizing critiques of empire, arguing that European colonialism was at its heart duplicitous and savage, had of course strongly emerged in early, early Enlightenment thinking from Montaigne and La Casas onwards, underpinned by the Lockean view of social contract whereby coercive government was held as necessarily invalid. Historians and literary critics have debated the views of the Anglo-Irish with regard to their own place as colonialists in Ireland. The historian David Hayton, present here, insists, for instance, that, quote, members of, um, if I may quote you back to, to yourself, <laughs> um, that um, members of the property elite in 18th century Ireland did not regard themselves as a colonial caste. Um, and Swift's depiction of the Yahoos, as numerous critics have pointed out, includes several elements of the still prevailing view of the wild Irish in uh, racial and beh behavioural terms. Swift's suspicion of Catholicism and dissent, his despair with the wretchedness of the Irish populace, and his failure to champion the dispossessed native Irish have resulted with some justice in the view of Swift's patriotism as primarily an Anglo-Irish phenomenon. Nevertheless, I wish to argue here that Swift's use of ironic and fictional forms, most notably, of course, in Gulliver's travels, enables conflicted and self-questioning modes of significance that transcend the merely personal elements of his worldview. This is not to detach his works from a basis in historical understanding, but rather to acknowledge what is inherently unstable and ultimately unresolvable in the genres that he worked with, not least that of realism. What distinguishes Swift's irony in A Modest Proposal from mere hyperbole is the verisimilitude it uh, achieves on many levels, not least the just shocking fact of cannibalism as a practice long associated with the Irish. Furthermore, his, the insistence of Swift's projector on the moderate and practical nature of his scheme is completely consistent with the tone of, of colonial authority bent on, quote, improvement. His very civility in attempting to alleviate Irish poverty, leading him with irrefutable logic to the barbarity that he suggests. Such aspects of realism, shared with the emerging genre of the novel in many ways, certainly added piquancy and bite, with no pun intended, to Swift's satire. 
Though Gulliver's Travels remains in many ways an untypical example of the novel, standing the conventions of realism on their head by playfully drawing its human protagonist through distortions of reality and fantasy worlds in its successive parts, its use of verisimilitude, typified by Gulliver's precise observations and measurements throughout, are very much in keeping with the genre, just as its rapid publication and dissemination through varied readerships ensured the fecund generation of its significance well beyond the control of its author or publishers. Turning finally and briefly to um, the novelist Charles Johnston, uh, C. 1719 to 1800, born in Limerick and educated at Trinity College, Dublin, we will examine briefly the novel he published in the febrile atmosphere leading to the American Revolution, The History of RCC's Prince of Betlis, published 1774, a work that demonstrates a Swiftian legacy played out in the public context of heated discussions in Britain regarding the rebelliousness of American colonists in the West and the rapacious behaviour of Indian nabobs, uh, usually in East India Company officials in the East, who had reduced the populous and fertile region of Bengal to abject famine by 1770. Within this context, events in America had notably revived patriotic sentiments in Ireland, significantly, significantly informing the intricate plot of Johnston's novel. Set in an expansive East and, exp in, and including in its sprawling narrative, historical in sp sprawling narrative, historical sp sorry, sorry. Let me read that again. Set in an expansive East and including in its sprawling narrative historical details of the founding of Carthage in the 9th century BCE and of the Muslim incursions of the 7th century into North Africa, amongst other instructive parallels, the history of Arsaces has been described as Johnston's quote, most thoughtful treatment of empire and colonialism. The novel commences with the protagonist, an Arab youth named Salim, leaving the sheltered life of his home to wander the world. His various adventures give him an insight into a wide range of societies before he realises his true identity as Arsaces, the prince of a small but fiercely resistant kingdom named Betlis under siege by the emperor whom he regards as his master, Temujin, or Genghis Khan. His reconciliation with the king of Betlis, his father Astyages, on the battlefield touches the heart of Temujin, resulting in the restitution of Astyages' kingship and the fulfilment of Arsaces' destiny as prince of Betlis and heir to the kingdom. The overarching narrative is clearly then a loyal and conciliatory one in relation to the American context, though Astyages' Acceptance of Temujin's imperial dispensation echoes patriotic arguments regarding legislative independence, which had long been aired in Ireland. A quote. Conqueror of the world, answered Astyages, it ill befitteth, befit, befitteth me to make terms with him into whose power I have willingly surrendered myself. If thou wilt permit me to study the happiness of my people and preserve them in the enjoyment of those laws which their fathers have handed down to them, we will render thee with fidelity all the services which can be expected from men who are free. <clears throat> Despite Astyages' promise of fidelity here, the recognition of his people's freedom and of his own monarchical duty to them renders his sur surrender a qualified one, its legalistic implications echoing Molyneux's claims for Ireland, carefully framed by the barrister Johnston. Though prudently dist distanced from contemporary events through spatial and temporal means, thereby avoiding possible suppression, Arsaces unmistakably refers to recent occurrences both in America and India, such coincidences being linked by implicit reference to the global activities of the East India Company. Selim's story frames the inset narrative of yet another imperial tale, that of his spiritual father Himilko, the sole survivor of the imperial city-state of Birza, modelled on Carthage. 
Himilco's travels into India, which he recounts to Selim, confront him with a scene of devastation which contemporaries would have recognized as descriptive of the Bengal famine of 1769 to 70, that had claimed around 10 million lives, around a quarter of the population, a disaster recalling analogously for Irish readers experiences of the major famine of 1740, which Johnson would have remembered from his student days in Dublin. The abject deprivation of the people leads them into the most dehumanizing forms of moral depravity. Quote, virgins offered themselves to violation in the street for a mouthful of food. The son sold his father into slavery. The mother devoured the infant which sucked her breast. The living were not able to bury the dead. Such descriptions in which pity is mingled with disgust at the utter depravity to which people are reduced by poverty and hunger, including acts of cannibalism, recall the wretched condition of the poor in early modern portrayals of Ireland, which had fed into Swift's Irish pamphlets, such as a short view of the state of Ireland and a modest proposal. Confronted by such horrors, Himilco gains an insight into the causes of the country's rapid decline through the expansion provided by a Brahmin, a representative of the elite native order within the emerging colonial order of 18th century India, who reveals that their hardy oppressors had arrived from the West, quote, in want and wretchedness, but quickly taking advantage of our pusillanimity and weakness had so reduced the rulers and industry of the people through their exploitative trading practices that the country had been utterly destroyed. Though the savagery and rapaciousness of the colonialists are castigated, there is acknowledgement too of the deficiencies of the East Indians who lacked the wit or courage to resist them. Yet the Brahmin notes presciently that the wickedness of these adventurers would not go punished Quote, heaven, by a signal I I uh, instance of its justice, hath made them avenge our wrongs upon their own heads. I think a uh, reference to the Boston Tea Party. Alluding to the charges of corruption brought against East India Company officials such as Robert Clive and the widespread protests against trading monopolies in Ireland and America from the early 1770s, the Brahmin's premonitory words suggest here a providential turn of justice that would consume the perpetrators of such iniquities despite their present wealth and arrogance. Like Swift's, however, Johnston's powerful satire of imperial hubris cannot be read without qualification as a critique of empire per se. Though he saw deeply into the global workings of empire and warned his age uncompromisingly of its moral failings, his own loyalist and providential views shape his understanding and limit the extent of his critique. His historical vision, though encompassing a wide range of earlier societies, is yet circumscribed by his loyal view of the perfection of monarchical government, though betrayed, as he saw it in his own times, by the interests of commercial empire and a corrupt political order. Though it has not been possible within this paper to examine in detail the many iterations of empire that are explored in the vast historical and geographical perspective provided by Arsaces, we may conclude with a specifically Gulliver-inspired moment of imperial fantasy, which suggests as well the distance that Johnson has travelled from his predecessor. Departing from Himilco's directions along his travel travels, the redoubtable Selim, as he still regards himself, enters a land in which he encounters a race of tiny creatures, no more than two cubits in height, whose naively comical reactions of fear and surprise on seeing him closely resemble the Lilliputians' response to Gulliver. Their lives, however, are soon threatened by a hideous creature, more slender and taller than any man, with a, quote, tawny skin, thinly shaded, with hair of the same colour. Though Selim immediately recognises the creature as, one of, as quote, one of those animals which make the middle link between the brute and human natures in the chain of life, the resemblance of his, quote, flat visage to the human face brings shame and horror to him. Slaying the horrid creature which preys on the little creatures, Selim is regarded as, as their saviour and given shelter in their subterranean city. Without um, any curiosity regarding the outside world and knowing no passion whatsoever, their simple underground lives represent a form of savage contentment 
of which Selim soon tires. Quote, convinced of the contemptible ignorance of those torpid visionaries, he leaves them without regret. So his untroubled destruction of the humanoid being, even though it is suggestive of proto-evolutionary views of humanity, and his firm affirmation of passion and knowledge, represent therefore a determinate moral choice, re rejecting the contentment of a savage state. His final discovery of his destiny as a prince is fully in keeping with his acceptance of a divine political order, ensuring a notion of human freedom that is properly secured through imperial and royal prerogatives. Johnston's exploration of other worlds, com comparable to Swift's, reveals a fuller understanding of the insidious workings of empire, and yet a more comfortable and stable view of European superiority. Surveying early Irish fiction from virtue rewarded to Arsaces via Swift, we see how colonial metaphors and debates regarding legislative in independence for Ireland are gradually transformed through history into a global understanding of imperialist practices through arms, intrigue and commerce. Though each of these authors wrote to different historical and political moments and worked within the genre that was rapidly changing and solidifying, the three fictions re re display remarkable continuities in their grapplings with the savage implications of empire and its precarious grasp on civility. Thank you. <laughs>